Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and transition now to uh, the importance of pre-operational checks of equipment. And we do have a, uh, a clip on that now too that we will play for you. I'm also a firm believer in that every worker in every one of our coal mines must do, absolutely must do, an adequate, a good adequate pre-op on whatever piece of mining equipment they're operating. Never take for granted that something on that piece of equipment could not cause an incident, could not cause an event, or, God forbid, could not cause a disaster. Regarding fires and explosions and fatalities in general, uh, what are the types of things that can happen when good pre-operational checks of the equipment aren't done very thoroughly? And if you have an example from your experience, please share that. Uh, some of the things that happen if you don't do good pre-op checks, I mean, one of the things we try to make everybody aware of in our minds is uh, the safety department and the examiners can't do everything for you. I mean, you have to be aware and take responsibility for your own safety. Therefore, whether it be an out-by area or the section or a piece of equipment you're using, you have to do your own pre-op checks and make sure that's right for your own safety because, you know, we want everyone to go home safely every day, but we can't do every check for everybody in the mine. So even if a check has been done previously by someone, some time has gone by, conditions could have changed, or something happened to that machine, so we want everyone to be responsible to make a, a good check. Just for example, when we charge our, we run around in a lot of two-man carts on the ground in our low conditions, and when we come out of the charging station outside, we go down steep grades to get to the pit to go into the mine, and we had an instance where they didn't do a good enough pre-op check and the brakes weren't working, they started down over the hill, realized they didn't have brakes, and uh, they just turned it into and ran it into the gravel on the side, but they got rolled off, and we had a lost time injury as a result of that. It could have been a lot worse, too, so. Thank you. Pre-operational checks, uh, big mind, little mind, are critical to anything you do. Whether it's a diesel 20 ton setting out on the haulage, to the, uh, the uh, loading machine, to the miner. Uh, people have to understand, and the way I project this to them when I, when I have my training, that's the job you choose, that's your responsibility. And that's from the load center to the machine, or it is the miner or the, 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 the motor, the man trip. It's critical that you do these checks. Uh, one of our operations, it's been several years, was an electrocution, and uh, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away, and I'm talking 30 years, and it doesn't go away. So uh, the, the young guys know that. It's, it's trained uh, on a quarterly basis with our ERP again, and definitely uh, we go heavy into it in our eight-hour refresher, the importance of a good sound pre-operational check on any piece of equipment, and that starts outside with your methane detector. That would be the first piece you're gonna do, that and your light. Okay, one more question for the two of you, uh, Tim and, and Tom, but uh, what's the depth of training that, uh, that, that you want your new equipment operators to get? Well, it depends uh, uh, on, let's just say, the piece of equipment. I'll just pick, I'll pick you two out. One would be, let's just say, a diesel piece of equipment. Uh, one day will be spent outside knowing how the whole diesel system works through the scrubbing systems, through the startup, through the pre-ops, and then we'll take you underground and see what you can physically do as far as operating. Uh, on a piece of equipment, you'll go into a task training. I'll, let's just pick a, a shear. Uh, a shear uh, that I'm familiar with, it, uh, pre-op on a shear starts as soon as you walk on the face and you would take a new guy with you, a new person that wants to, to learn that job, he's going to need a little bit more time than just a day or two to get the gist of it. And what we need to do is to, to we, we let them uh, learn, we let them run, and then we let them basically learn a bit more and then we let them go a little bit. Uh, sometimes it could take a few days, Sometimes it doesn't take very long at all, uh, and then sometimes it might take a week to really get to touch the feel of the machine. Okay, good, thank you. Tom? 
depth of training, I mean, you, you do as well as you can with uh, your annual refresher trainings, with your task trainings. You know, you go over and over it, you watch them operate it, you make sure they're comfortable. Uh, but even the experienced guys, I think it continues every day throughout their career. I mean, even though they're comfortable with it, you know, there may be emergency controls or situations that if you don't use it, you lose it. So uh, yeah. I think it's important to evaluate them ongoing at all times. And uh, even though you're not formally training them every day, just to, to observe their operation, we do audits to, for efficiency and to make sure they know how to use all the controls. Uh, because over time, uh, even if you get experienced, uh, there's still some things you forget if you don't use them every day. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, okay, now Rick and Jeff, together you can, you can alternate the way you wish. But uh, what do you often, most often see that is something that was missed during your pre-operational checks? Well, I, I get back to TASH training. <clears throat> you know, TASH training is something that is approved in your plan. So you get a Part 48 approved plan, it'll tell you how to TASH train, what needs covered, supervised door in production, supervised door in non-production, wherever the HASCOM program, those are all in the training plan. So if a person is properly task trained and when he's doing his pre-operational checks, he knows what to look for. Two and a half weeks ago at a mine at the West Virginia, Virginia border, had a gas well and they were mining around the gas well. Bigger pillars, you have to get, do things that are a little bit unique. The one shift was left, the other shift went in and they went in and had an ignition. And the problem was the fan sprays were turned the wrong way. You have to understand, if you're properly task trained on that mining machine and you're going backwards around a gas well, not nor normal to your normal operating proce procedures, you run into something like that. They had an ignition. Thank God we didn't have anybody killed. And again, um, people from that worked for me down at EFS were sent down to monitor to make sure that these people were given proper task training again. Not only that, but the guy that did the on shift missed it. They have to go over the sprays on the miner. He should have picked it up. Again, training the human factor, strumming into people more and more and more. We get better pre-operational checks. We get less people hurt, maimed, and killed. Excellent points. Jeff? From the Commonwealth standpoint, one of the things we've seen is that uh, we are in charge of the certification process, too, which means all persons who operate a piece of equipment underground must be certified. That means they have to stand before the mine inspector and go through a certification process. Now, once again, once they receive that certification, they're good for a lifetime. Uh, I hate to say it, but one of the things that our mine inspectors have the capability of doing is affecting the livelihood of that person from the miner all the way up to the uh, machine operators. A case in point was, once again, like as Rick stated, that we had a situation three, four months ago where a mine inspector was just questioning underground, actually it was on the surface, the duties of a machine operator. What would you do in case of this or that? And the guy basically said, I don't know. Now what that means is, okay, A, he was Cash trained, he didn't pay attention, uh, or whatever the case may be. So we always have that option of saying, okay, they immediately marched him into the mine foreman's office and basically said, this person cannot go underground. Now, when that happens, that affects the livelihood of the mine because if that is your only roof boulder, what are you going to do now? So immediately, training was done on the spot to correct that action. Unfortunately, training is always the proactive, and once again, enforcement is the second arm of that to make sure that once again, that when the people are being trained, that they are following the rules of the training to make sure that, that everybody comes out of that mine in a safe manner. Okay, excellent. Uh, on these four topics, we've had some pretty good exchanges, and I think some really good insights that you've all provided. So we're gonna transition now into the research side of things, but we're gonna end on a note here of, uh, of a situation that where everything was done right. Oh.
I'd like to tell you about an event that took place at a coal mine that I worked at earlier in my mining career. We had a, an event at that coal mine, an incident, I guess you would call it, where we had a well-ventilated area. It was in a pillar mine where we were actually extracting 100% full pillar mining. And we had an area of the mine where we had the bottom bump. And what I mean by a bottom bump, we had major bottom breakage and that allowed a massive methane accumulation to exit the bottom and to actually inundate the section. Now, inundate means it just flooded over top of our mining equipment. And to this day, I am so happy that we ran by a running right philosophy at that mine, whereby our people did things right. What do I mean by doing things right? Well, the area was well rock dusted. The permissibility on the equipment was well done, well maintained. The ventilation was well engineered in that mine and the ventilation checks being made by the on-shift and pre-shift examiners were done on schedule and to ensure that we did have proper ventilation. When the methane first exited the bottom and inundated the section, the ventilation system initially did not handle it. Even though it was as designed, proper in every way, the methane did come out over top of our mining equipment. It took a while, not long, five minutes maybe, for the methane to then exit away from the mining equipment and go back up through the pillar dot area into the gob. And again, I'm just so happy that uh, the people did things right at that mine. Uh, the rock dusting, again, up to snuff 100%. The equipment, no accumulations, no float dust allowed to accumulate on anything. Because anything would have gone wrong, I would not be talking to you today about an incident. I'd be talking to you about an event, an explosion that could have killed, we had 10 people on that crew and who knows what damage could have been done had that methane ignited.